And as always, we ask for God's blessing as we hear the reading of God's word. Today's reading is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphyla, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds and power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Jerusalem and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portent in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Friends, we have heard the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In a way they understand. You know what I love about this time of year? Just about everything. There are colors everywhere and if you are like me, the danger of frost is past and you're able not just to plant plants, but you're able to sow seeds in the garden and watch them grow and fruit until the fall. I ran into a problem recently in the garden. Our two blueberry bushes were putting out new leaves, except these leaves were not dark green leaves, which means that if they're dark green, then it tells you that everything is okay as far as chlorophyll and the process is good. Instead, the leaves were bright yellow and veiny. However, the corn I planted just a few feet away from these blueberry bushes are growing at a great speed. So is the broccoli and the green beans. Now, I did what any gardener like me would do. I blamed it on the blueberries. Look, the corn gets it, the strawberries get it, the asparagus get it, the onions, beans, the peppers, they're all doing fine. Why don't you get it? Wow, well, that's silly, but it's fun to think about. Actually, I sat down and began to research what the issue was. Do you know what the issue was? It was the soil. Blueberries love acidic soil, and the soil into which it was planted was too alkaline, which meant that it could not access the iron in the soil. Now, I could dump more and more iron into the soil, but if the soil is not right, if it's not acidic enough, then no matter how much iron you put in the soil, the, bla the blueberries would not be able to access it. I had to change the strategy. In this case, coffee grounds are going to suffice for this year. But you can't treat a blueberry bush like a pepper plant, or even like corn or beans or anything else. And as I've learned is the case, you probably shouldn't blame the plant. Acts chapter two is a story of growth. It is the day the Christian church, this Jesus community, went from 120 people to over 3,120 people. Something went right. Something went very right. 
It was the gift of the Holy Spirit that allowed people to access the grace of God that they had been looking for, that they had journeyed for, that they had talked about and dreamed about. And though this passage from Acts chapter 2 about the gift of the Holy Spirit happened in such a public and flamboyant way, this gift of the Spirit still happens today. And I would argue it happens every day. And it happens because God continually keeps the promise to pour out the Spirit upon boys and girls, young and old, so that they could access the grace and goodness and blessings of God just for them. Now, it happens, this gift of the Holy Spirit, it happens when the gospel and the heart connect in a way that we get it. Now, Pentecost is an ancient Jewish harvest festival. It was the first harvest of spring that happened about 50 days after Good Friday. Pentecost was a major Jewish holiday, and that's why Jewish and God-fearing people from all over the region would travel to Jerusalem to celebrate there and to worship and to fellowship. Now, the crowd that was gathered there on that day was incredibly diverse, each group with their own culture, their own language, their own spiritual background, and their own unanswered questions. And Jews and those who were not born into Ju Judaism but found a spiritual home there, they came to Jerusalem to worship. So that means that as they were traveling, God-loving men and women, boys and girls, friends and strangers alike, all began this journey. Now, to put it in perspective, people from Rome came to Jerusalem. As the crow flies, that is 1,400 miles. That is the equivalent of people from Wichita, Kansas, or New Orleans, Louisiana, or Miami, Florida, making the trek to Poughkeepsie. But they didn't fly. They walked familiar roads to familiar places and eventually came to Jerusalem. Different places, different faces, similar desires to worship and to know God and to fellowship with God's people. Now, on this particular Pentecost, the followers of Jesus, that is the 11 disciples, their wives and their children, and the other people who followed Jesus are gathered into a room, all 120 of them. And this group is homogenous, meaning that they're very similar in language, culture, and religious background. But outside is this teeming mass of diversity. It's a great juxtaposition. And as they met together in that room, probably to pray and to worship, as they met together, a strong wind came and the Holy Spirit rested on each one of them. And then all of a sudden, this timid group wanted to go outside and preach about Jesus Christ to the thousands and thousands of people gathered there. And so the 120 preach. Now, I love the idea of a young boy or a young girl telling people about Jesus. Sometimes they are able to communicate in a way that others can. Now, this is interesting. As the 120 people preach, the listeners doesn't, they don't have to translate. They hear the gospel in their own language. Now, they didn't have the ability to say, Google, translate this so that they understand me. It's interesting. It's miraculous. One person preached, the others understood. And the people are confused and suggest that perhaps the disciples were drunk. Now, of course, they're poking fun. And besides, I've never known someone who drank too much to get smarter as the day went on. So these disciples are incredibly so preaching in a different language. Peter then says, listen. Listen carefully. What is happening in front of all of you today is what our prophet Joel said would happen. Now, all of the people gathered there, they understand who Joel is. They understand the writing. Peter and probably many, many others have it committed to memory. And as Peter stands with the 11 other disciples there, uh, as he stands with the other disciples there, 
I would imagine that Peter considers himself and his wife and their children, the disciples and their families, and he considers what he sees as boys and girls, men and women, and the prophet Joel's words. And he says to them, God is keeping the promise. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Upon all flesh, all language, doesn't matter the color of your skin, the sound of your dialect, nothing. What God had promised in Joel is that one day, Everyone would have access. The gospel, this religion, this faith wouldn't be for just one group of people, but it would be meant to be shared by everyone to everyone. In other words, God is going to come to us in a way that is specifically for us, that hits our heart, that transcends all of our differences. Getting back to the garden that the gospel and the work of the Spirit is going to amend the soil of our heart so that we can access the grace and forgiveness, the hope and the reconciliation that we long for. And that's what I find daunting, and that's also what I find beautiful about the act of preaching, that the gospel goes out to boys and girls, men and women, young and old, And through the Spirit's gifting, through this mysterious and mystical work of the Spirit, the gospel grows in our heart. That's also the promise of our baptism, where God says, I will be your God and you will be mine forever. That's a promise that God continues to keep. That promise was spoken by Joel. It was spoken and lived by Jesus. And God helps you and I access that grace and those, the benefits of those promises through prayer, through the sacraments of baptism and communion, and through the hearing or the reading of the word of God. And it's in those moments that God comes to you in a unique way that's just for you. And it comes, and it comes to someone else in a way that they could understand. Have you ever thought about that? That the word that is proclaimed to you might land on your heart a certain way and connect with you, but it may act differently or be received differently by someone else. But we are called to give thanks when God does touch our hearts and kind of opens up new ways of thinking for us. Now, that is what I think is beautiful in our faith, that there is one God And that this God gives many, many gifts. That this one God comes to the many in a very peculiar and special way for that individual. Now, as I close, I just want to say this. Pentecost is regular. Though the types of days mentioned in our passage are rare, Pentecost itself is an ongoing process. It happens over and over again. Even our ancient Jewish brothers and sisters celebrated Pentecost, not just every now and again, but regularly, year after year. You know why? Because every year, there's always a new blessing. Now, as you think about how the gospel came to you, maybe you were an adult or a teenager or you were younger, is there someone for whom you should give thanks to God for? Sunday school teacher, a minister, a friend, a coworker, someone else. These people planted the gospel. They threw the seeds and it landed on the soil of your heart. And then through the work of the spirit and the grace of God that is bearing fruit and growing in your life. I take great comfort in that, that God knows what needs to happen in me for me to have ears to hear and eyes to see the good news of Jesus Christ. And of course, we want to ask God to bless our efforts as a congregation as we continue, as we continue for over 304 years to plant the gospel, to cast it out, 
to proclaim the gospel and to pray that it flourishes as it reaches people in a way that they understand. All of this comes by the goodness and the grace of God, and for that we give thanks. We have heard the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.